Hi, good morning. Uh, I've gotten the signal. My name is John Barrowman. I'm really happy to be here with you all this morning. I work as a recruiter in the field of business valuation. Uh, some people use the term headhunter. That's okay with me. You can call me anything you want, just don't call me late to dinner. Um, well, I usually think it's a better laugh. I'll try it again. Um, <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Um, another way to think about what I do is that I am in the jobs looking for people business. I'm not in the people looking for jobs business, which is another way of saying that while I'm happy to deliver all the information I have today and be as helpful as I can, the likelihood of my being a conduit for somebody just starting out in this profession to getting a job in the profession, those odds are kind of small, just for a variety of reasons I can talk about later if you want. But I just wanted to let you know that up front, just in the interest of having proper expectations, okay? Another thing to point out is that while this is about business valuation, I know there may be some students in here, are there some who are in the forensic accounting program? Okay. Um, some of what I'm going to say applies to forensic accounting. There are, there's at least one place in here. I'll try to make the distinction so you understand how it might not. Um, <clears throat> basically, when, I, when you hear me talk about litigation support, that's probably as closely related to forensic accounting as you'll hear me talk about. But I wanted to make that kind of distinction, okay? Um, I call this a 30,000 foot view because um, one of the advantages for me in doing what I do is I get to see the forest, okay? If you work in this field, and even if you have an extensive 25 or 30 year career, you might be lucky enough to get to see six or seven trees, okay? And it's, it's easy to assume that the tree, that all the other trees in the forest pretty much look like the tree you're standing next to. But obviously that's not the case, okay? So that's why this is a 30,000 foot view, a look at the profession from how I see it looking above. Now, the disadvantage of that is <clears throat> There are lots of variations among the trees that are not necessarily apparent to me, okay? So there's a certain amount of generalization in this. I want to let you know that, and we may discover some of those as we talk about questions. Lastly, when we get to the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers, and we'll just go until we run out of questions, all right? So first of all, I like to talk about this at the very beginning, and that is, why does this happen? Why do people want to have business valuation done, all right? So from where I sit, there are probably three main reasons, okay? The first one has to do with taxes, or avoiding taxes, all right? And that's usually things like estates or bus businessmen want to want to give the business to the kids, and they wants to protect it in a certain kind of way, or he wants to set up a trust or an estate. And before the attorney can do the work that the attorney needs to do, somebody has to tell the attorney what it's worth. Okay, so that's where business valuation comes in. Second one, obviously, buying and selling businesses. Sometimes before you've bought it, sometimes after you've bought it, when maybe you're not too happy with it. Also, um, the adventures that we had with Enron back in the early 2000s triggered a whole bunch of other regulations which drive business valuations in different ways, but they all essentially have to do with buying and selling. Okay? It's, a, it's very fundamental. I told you a lot. There's some generalization to this. And the third one is litigation. Okay? Um, two partners in a business decide they want to split the business, they can't agree on anything, they don't know what it's worth, they have, you know, maybe they're fighting really, really bad, they've, they've gotten mad at each other, and they're suing each other. Well, somebody has to tell the judge what it's worth, okay? And if you're lucky, as people who do this, there's actually two people, because each of them will hire somebody, you know? Either side will want to go. So litigation, and um, although 
These first two things may change over time in the sense that tax law and tax regulation will change. And in the sense that certain regulations that govern buying and selling businesses and accounting may change, the litigation part of it is going to go forever. Okay? Because as long as people are arguing and as long as people are suing each other, and that's never going to stop, there'll always be a business. Okay? So, where does it happen? And here's where I want to, in a minute, I'll make the distinction with forensic accounting, okay? Business valuation as a business <clears throat> occurs in two basic forms. The first one of those is as one of several service lines inside a CPA firm. Now that's where you're most likely to also find the forensic accounting, all right? It may be part of BV, it may be part of other. Okay? But when, again, when it comes to business valuation, the other most common form is as an independent BV practice. As with everything I'm going to talk about today, there are exceptions. There are exceptions to this. But those exceptions are very, very few in number. All right? Generally, people work in one of those two kinds of businesses. And so if you're thinking about looking for jobs, that's how you want to think about it. You're going to, you're going to look for a job in one or the other. All right? <clears throat> what is the career path? This is what people like to know. Okay? Now, what I'm going to show you is not necessarily distinct levels, not distinct jobs, but I'm going to speak about this in general functional terms. For example, at the very beginning, you're going to do a lot of data entry, you're going to do a lot of research, and you're going to do some analysis. And as you grow and go up the food chain, you'll do more analysis, you'll do some modeling, and you'll start to do some writing. Okay? And again, I want to point out, these are not distinctively separate functions. In other words, somebody who's doing some writing may also be doing data entry. Sometimes somebody at the very top of the food chain is doing data entry. Okay? Just because there's nobody else to do it. All right? You continue to move up. You do a little more writing. You start reviewing the work of other people below you. Maybe. And you start to have some client contact. Because you're managing the engagement, you're starting to talk to the clients, maybe the attorneys, whoever it is that you're dealing with. So you're having, it's more outside contact. Okay? It's not all inside. Next up, you do even more reviewing, because that's your main job, and a lot of client contact, and you start doing some selling, okay? And at the top of the chain, of course, is ownership. Now, <clears throat> obviously, if you're the only person in the business, and you're the owner, then you do all that stuff, okay? And there are many people in this business who make that trade-off because they like it that way. They don't want employees. They don't like having to deal with all of that. And they would just as soon do all of these lower-level functions in exchange for not having that other obligation. Okay? Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is this. Okay? There is this ceiling. There is this red line, okay, above which you do not rise in this profession without learning to sell. Okay? This is consulting services. It's in the very broad category of consulting services. In any kind of consulting services. You simply do not rise to the top unless you learn to sell. Now this is not like going door to door and selling Britannica. I used to, I can tell you. But, but it does mean getting out and networking and schmoozing and talking to people and generating business. Okay? Just want to make that point. 
What does it pay? Now, this is the question that I get asked most often, okay? And everybody perks up, oh, well, well, now, what does this pay, okay? Now, I'm going to give you some actual numbers, but I want to tell you again, these numbers vary depending on the size of the firm you go into, the sophistication of the firm that you go into. Um, if <clears throat> If you're somebody who's really keyed in on work-life balance and you say, you know, 55, maybe 60 hours a week, that's all I'm interested in. Well, that's going to pay you one thing. All right? I'm working with a client right now where sometimes their work weeks are 90 and 100 hours. Not every week. Goes up and goes down. But they pay very well very, very well. Their total compensation for people at these lowest levels is almost double what you can find in most practices. It's up to you. Okay? But what does it pay? Let's get going. At this entry level, probably in the high 40s to high 50s. Okay? Can you, make, can you, can you get a higher paying job at this level? Yeah, you can. Sure you can. All right? But these are just kind of general ranges. Moving up to that next level, mid-50s, to low to mid-80s. Mid-70s to low 110s. Okay? Low 100s to mid-170s. That starts to get pretty good. All right? You can make a lot of money in this business. You really can. Okay? When I say and up, there are people who make seven hundred and fifty thousand to a million dollars in compens total compensation. That's when it's gonna show up on their W two. Now, do they work a lot of hours? You can bet they do. I was meeting with one of them last week who billed thirty eight hundred hours last year for his company. Okay? But he's gonna make a lot of money. But once again, whoa, where did we go? Sorry. Once again, we have our magic red line. Alright? You're not going to get above that line in either functionally in the organizational chart or in compensation without selling, without a material contribution to revenue, is the way that I would say it. Just not going to happen, okay? And I was explaining to some folks earlier that back during the recession, 2007, 2008, there were any number of people who were bouncing around right there, who had been in the business a long time, who were highly technical people, really, really qualified but they couldn't sell to save their necks. They just weren't those kinds of people. Who do you think was the first to get laid off? Okay? That's what happened. Some of them just had to leave the business. Okay? So there you are. That's what it pays. If you can learn to sell, there's no limit. Really. Are credentials important? Okay? People ask about that. That's a question that's come up a lot. And there are multiple answers to that. <clears throat> like a lot of these questions, the answer, or like, like the questions that you answer, like the question you get from a client who says, what's my business worth? The answer usually starts with the phrase, well, it depends. So, it depends. All right? They do help you get your foot in the door. They do. Okay? Mainly because there are many, many people who, who say they want to get into business valuation at an entry level. And, and they're all excited about it because there's, there's, there's just a juice about doing it. Okay? But they get into it, and a couple of years later, they decide, oh, you know, gee, I want to go do something else. Well, how happy would you be as an employer? You've invested all that payroll, all that training, and off they go, okay? So the difference 
that a credential can make is making it known that you're not that kind of person. That you're somebody who is self-selected for the profession. Okay? That's where it's useful. It demonstrates commitment to the profession. Ongoingly. Okay? Whether you're already in it and you're completing a credential or starting it. It demonstrates a commitment. I regularly talk to employers who will, uh, who will look at somebody's background, somebody's resume, who's been in the business five, six, seven more years. No credentials. And they'll say, well, how come? Why don't they? Aren't they really interested? Don't they want to grow professionally? What, what does that tell you? You know? Now, are there people who, who are in this a long time without credentials? Yes, there are. Okay? I'm just telling you that in the future, going forward, you want your career to advance, credentials make Im are important there. There you go. They are important to advancement and career moves, to demonstrating to the employer, to your boss, that you're serious. Now, this last point is, the, is one of the most surprising things that I've ever discovered. There is little or no correlation to compensation. And you would think, what? But it's true. I did some, I have done three different salary surveys in the business valuation profession. And in one of them, I specifically looked for that correlation. You know, is there a correlation between compensation and any business valuation? Not any one specific, but any business valuation credential. I saw a 4% premium at the most. Now, I couldn't figure out why that is. I asked about 10 different people why they thought that was, and I got 10 different answers. Okay? I think maybe it has to do with the fact that it's, and this is not to denigrate, I mean, it's just reinforcement of what I was saying before, it's way more important to the employer than it is to the market. Okay? Because, because of how it demonstrates commitment, because how it's important to advancement and career. It's just, it's just not important enough to the eventual buyer that would cause him to pay a little bit more money simply because you have it. All right? And that's where it really translates to payroll. Okay? I just had to throw that in because it's, it's just a reality of it. Because a lot of people will think, oh, well, hey, you know, I finished that credential. By golly, I ought to get this big raise or I ought to get more money if I change jobs. Well, not necessarily. Okay? Business valuation. What is the good news? I got this from these points. I was talking to some people who had been in business valuation two or three years. Okay? They came from not knowing anything about it. They're about two or three years in the profession. I went back to them and I said, okay, now, if I'm talking to somebody who's not in it, who's thinking about getting into it the way you're now into it, what's the good news? Well, first of all, you get a broad exposure to how businesses work, all right? You will, in, in a year's time, you will get a close-up look at more businesses than you could imagine. Certainly more than you would ever get if you were working inside a business. So if this is something that, that has a lot of juice for you, you just like to see how businesses work, man, you can't get any better. A lot of different businesses, you get to see how they work. It is learning intensive because every one of those new businesses requires that you learn all over again about that new field. You know? Today it's a, today it's a retailer. Tomorrow it's a manufacturer. Next week it's a wholesaler. Next week after that it's a distribution company. You know? You just never really know. The week after that it's a doctor's practice. His wife is suing him for divorce, and she wants half the practice. You've got to go figure out what it's worth. Okay? A lot of variety. Intensive, intellectually challenging. It is project-oriented. And that's what I think most people like about it. It's something new all the time. All the time. Okay? It really is. It's always something new. Over time, if you're in it long enough, you may tend to 
narrow your specialty into a particular industry or into a particular kind of segment, but even then, you're always running into something new. There's always something about, no, even, if the, even if all you ever work on is auto dealerships, for example, and there are people who specialize in that, there's always something just a little bit different about how these guys run it versus how those guys run it. Okay? And that's where the learning comes in. Lastly, now, after I said what I said earlier, this may not make much sense, but this is in the context of tax work, for example. There's not, a, there's not a, just a knock you on your behind busy season, for example. Okay? It, it, the exception to this is litigation. If you're involved in litigation, then you're dealing with deadlines that are set by judges and attorneys, okay? And your life is not your own. Uh, it's not a bad thing, you know, because you can make a lot of money doing it. But, you know, it's like this. The work week is like this. But in, in pretty much valuation, your work week is like this. It really is, okay? And you can have a decent amount of control over it. So, I suppose we could quibble over the definition of normal, but that's what some of these young people said to me. What is the bad news? Because nobody ever tells you what's the bad news about a profession, why you might not want to get into it. And this is not about why you wouldn't want to get into it, unless you really don't like this stuff. But I think it's fair to let you know what you're in for. It's easy to go down the rabbit hole. Okay? You can think that, gosh, man, if I just spent another 10 hours researching this, I just need more data. You know, I just need a little more, I need, to, I need to run this model again. I need to look at this analysis. I needed to, well, that's, that's good for you. The problem is your client may not pay you for it, okay? And you've, you've spent that kind of time, and your boss has paid you for that kind of time, but he can't turn around and bill the client. So that's the bad news. There's a tendency to go down the rabbit hole, especially when you're starting. And it's very, very difficult to learn where the balance is. It really is. It is not, this is, this is a fresh one somebody gave me, this is not a profession for someone who likes to be right. Okay? Because no matter how right you think you are, there's somebody else who's ready to tell you that you're wrong. And they're ready to tell you why you're wrong. Okay? And that person may be on the other side of the courtroom. Okay? So this is not a business for people who like to be right. All right? After all, the deliverable is an opinion. Right? It is an opinion of value. You've obviously got to back up your opinion. You've got to buttress your opinion. You've got to explain why you have that opinion. But if you ever slide over into wanting to be right about your opinion, you can get... It's, it's not good for you. It's not good. It is highly, highly detailed work. Okay? There are some people who who like the highly detailed, they just don't like the highly, highly detailed work, okay? And this is especially true if, if the work you're doing is in litigation, okay? Because you absolutely have to cross every T and dot every I, and it must be absolutely perfect. Because if it's not, your client can lose millions of dollars, big time, okay? It's, it's highly detailed work, you know, and there are people who, you know, if the job requires going this far to get it right, they're okay with going this far, but go that far? Nah, I got something else to do this weekend, you know? I want to go to the whatever, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want my friend's got a boat, I'm going to... No, you've got to be prepared to go all the way. It's highly detailed work. I asked this question of these people. 
So what is it they didn't tell you? What don't they tell you about business valuation? All right? That your accounting knowledge is important. There are people who go into this with a lot of finance background, and that's good, okay? But you're going to, whatever valuation or litigation or especially even the forensic accounting work you do, you're going to be looking at income statements and balance sheets and tax returns until you go blind looking at them. You will. And if you don't have some kind of an accounting background to help you understand what it is you're seeing, you can be lost. Doesn't mean you need an accounting ma major, but you know, some kind of, some accounting hours, some accounting background is, is really, really important and very useful. You have to explain things, okay? You don't, you don't get to just hand it in and walk. Now you do at the lower levels, okay, because you're not expected to do anything more. But you have to explain, and sometimes you have to take an oath on the witness stand and explain it to the opposing counsel or explain it to the jury. You have to explain your results, okay? And if you're not comfortable in having to explain what you got and how you got it, may not be the place for you. What else they don't tell you? Client data can be crap. Sorry, but it can, okay? Most of the, most of the classwork that you do will be based on well, I don't know if they're necessarily audited financial statements, but, you know, clean, good-looking financial statements. Income statements, balance sheets, you know, you're going to clean, all right? Well, just wait till you get a client that hands you a shoebox of check registers. And that's their accounting system. They don't have a general ledger. They don't have anything else. It's well, we just write checks. And maybe they have the invoices that they wrote the checks for, and maybe they don't. Okay? So get ready. W w and, and if you can imagine, you know, you thought you were going to start here and go forward with this project. No, you got to go back here and do all of this, and then you can go forward. Okay? So that's what they don't tell you. Client data can be crap. And finally, soft skills are key. They really, really are. Okay? Maybe not at these very lowest levels in that hierarchy, but they are to get all the way up. Okay? They're, they are key when it comes to, at, even at a managerial level, overseeing the work of other people, reviewing it, dealing with them, Get it, keeping them going, and there's certainly a key when it comes to being at the very top of the food chain and getting out, meeting potential clients, referral sources, and getting them to refer work to you, okay? Because, precisely because this is a business of judgment, and that's, that's my sermon, it always has been, you know, because if your deliverable is an opinion, then you are, by definition, in the business of judgment, okay? And if you are in the business of judgment, people buy because they trust you. You know? You can walk into an, an auto showroom, and you can touch the car, and you can sit in the car, and you can drive the car. And therefore, you can have some trust about the car, okay? And you do research online, and you know the brand, and maybe you've owned those cars for years and whatever. But you want a business valuation, you really have to trust the person that you're going to hire to do it. And so if you're going to develop that trust, soft skills are key. They really, really are to get that done, okay? Last, I think this is one of the last things here. Um, so why should you do this? What is the demand? 
And we were talking to Denise earlier about this, and I think you should look at the demand as, yes, there's, there's an, an immediate short-term demand for talent, but what I want to talk to you about is the long-term, okay? And the way I'll do that is by this. The red line represents, let's just call it, other careers, okay? As you get experience, your value, the demand for your talent, rises because you have more experience. You're more valuable. If you're in the field of business valuation, however, look at what the blue line does. Now, this long explanation for why that is and how that is, but in my experience, it is. Okay? And so if you can get into the profession, if you can get a foothold, put your head down, work hard, show your value. Along about here, I'm not going to tell you you've got it made in the shade, but you can, this would be a great career. Okay? A really, really great career for you. Because the, the demand just goes right on up. Okay? Now, the, remember the red line? Remember the red line? The red line applies to that, too. Okay? Sooner or later, it's going to, boop, it's going to go straight over. Okay? And in fact, it's going to go like this and then it's going to go like this, okay? Which is what happened to those people I was telling you about when the recession came along and they couldn't sell, all right? The demand will go back down and it will bite you in the butt. So, here we go. Oh, come on. It's question time. And when we were getting this all set up, I said, well, we'll have Q&A until we run out of Q. So it's time for the queue, and um, I think we've even got some folks online, and there's a chat room, and y'all can, I used to live in Texas, y'all, uh, send in your questions, but let's start. Anybody here, and, and Rich, I'm going to need some help getting this over to the chat room thing, so. Questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead. With your experience, um, you know, well, let me give you a little backstory. So I'm trying to find a job in business valuation. Yes. And a lot of times, it's not. It doesn't specifically say business valuation job. Do you know of any other terms they might use or like titles for jobs? <coughs> you know, like analyst or you know something like that. I mean, yeah, I've, I've run into some issues with that. Like I type in business valuation, and I get some results, but I don't know if there's maybe some other terms to use that maybe professionals might use when they're looking for someone. Um, good question, and I think the answer is no, they're not, okay? And that your, your best bet is to continue to use business valuation or litigation support or forensic accounting, be sure to use them in quotation marks, as your search terms, all right? Um, what you risk by just using financial analyst is all those jobs at Coca-Cola and such and such shoe company and, you know, like that. If it's a job in business, if the job is genuinely in business valuation, that phrase will show up either in the title or somewhere in the description to the extent that your search will catch it. And the fact that you're not seeing very many is simply emblematic of there aren't very many, all right? Now, which may sound, watch me if my answers get long here and long-winded, which may sound counter to what I'm saying about demand, okay? But you've got, but you got to remember, oh, wow. Do I need to do anything? Say, say, say. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I meant short term. Oh, my, okay, fine. Um, so once you accumulate that experience that puts you above you know, gets you a little more, when the curve started going up, okay, lots of demand. At, at the entry level, what you're competing with is the 
the normal difficulty in securing an entry level position. All right? Yes? I do have a question, but I do actually have a piece of advice for you. Um, I used to work on Wall Street, and I think maybe a good alternative, at least to start, is like private equity. Or I worked at a hedge fund, and they had a private equity arm, and that allowed at least to be able to learn how to do discounted cash flow analysis and projected cash flow. And, um, at least valuation is not like a stereotypical valuation in a true business valuation sense for IRS purposes or marital dissolution purposes, but that's... No, it can be, yeah. Um, but a question that I had when you were talking about credentials. Do yes. You have in, uh, do you have a list of credentials? And a lot of people have, you know, 10 acronyms behind their names and which ones you feel as though are the most important and... Well, there are... There are three primary creden credentials in the field, okay? Um, one of them is uh, given, bestowed, granted, whatever you, what's the verb, I don't know, by an, uh, the American Society of Appraisers. And that one requires completing um, four different exams and accumulating 10,000 hours of experience, which is like five years, okay? And then there is, uh, there is a credential offered by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, which is the Accredited in Business Valuation, ABV credential. And I'm embarrassed. I don't know exactly what the credentials are. They're not that much different from ASA. There's a certain reciprocity. This is a credential that's held more often by CPAs because it was by their society. And then finally, there is an entirely separate third independent credential, uh, which is the Certified Valuation Analyst, or CVA, which is offered by the National Association of Certified Valuation Analysts. And Rick Gray, who is one of the instructors here, um, is an instructor for them and can tell you way more than I could about that process of getting that credential. Those are the three. I think there's, IBA still offers a credential, don't they? But I think they're part of NACPA now. They're part of NACPA now. So there's three credentials. So how imperative do you feel is a CPA? Not. Okay. Not very. The accounting experience, yes. The credential itself, to the degree that the credential represents the exposure, right. okay. yes in that context, okay? okay? In and of itself, maybe not. Okay. Thank you. Okay? the questions here? Well, let's go, okay. Um, credential, what credentials are best to have? Yeah, we got that one. Uh, elaborate further on the short term for interlope position greater in Miami or Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the answer to that is probably, well, the answer to that is Miami, okay? And, but I'm going to use that to spring to a different, to a, well, a broader based answer, a broader based question, okay, which I often get, which is, well, where are the jobs? Where are the cities with the most jobs? Okay. The answer to that is the, the volume of opportunities is a function of the size of the market. Okay. And so the reason I say there are more opportunities in Miami than Fort Lauderdale is because Miami is larger than Fort Lauderdale. Okay? That's all. You know, there are more jobs in Miami than there are in Fort Lauderdale. There are more BV jobs in Chicago than there are in Miami. There are more in New York than there are in Chicago. That's all. Okay? It's just a function of the size of the market. There's nothing, there's no secret, there's no... There are no geographies that are just like, oh, everybody's there. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, their business valuation is done in some of the most out-of-the-way places that you'd ever imagine, really. Very, very small markets, because it does need to be done. It's just that the people who do it in those markets, well, there is a certain, there's a certain market size. I couldn't tell you what it is okay, necessarily, but there's a certain market size below which nobody is doing it full-time. 
because there's not that much demand. All right? And if there are no firms where anyone is doing it full time, the chances are pretty good they're not going to want to hire you to do it full time. Now, if you're open to being what I call a two position player, there's a whole different advantage. Okay? If you say, you know what, gosh, I'd, I'd be 25, 30, 40 percent billable in tax if I could be the rest billable in business valuation, that opens up a whole different universe. Not a big one necessarily, but a whole different one that I'm not even talking about. Okay? Let's see. Uh, which credentials? Yeah, okay, covered that. Which part of the country? Higher demand? There's, that's the answer to that. It's just a function of the uh, size of the market. Any other questions from the online? Oh, no, I guess not. Uh, question, Mike. John, you talked about soft skills. Yes. Can you elaborate and uh, what soft skills and also how would somebody develop those soft skills? Ooh, wow, wow. That, that, thank you, thank you. No, nobody really asks that question and it's really, really important. Okay. Um, I'm going to use a colloquialism. Scoff soft skills, a gift of gab. Okay? The ability to walk into a room and walk up to a stranger and start talking. That's one. Okay? Um, the ability to, and this one's going to be, this, this one doesn't come easy, and you have to be in the business a little bit of time, but it's the ability to listen to someone talk about his or her business and discern, because that's the word, discern an a business opportunity. You talk to somebody and he's telling, I don't know, I could give you, there's probably a gazillion examples, but he's talking, well, he's had this kind of problem. Oh, oh, yeah, here's a good one. <clears throat> You just, you just sit and, you know, you run into somebody at a golf club or wh what knows kind of an event, and he's talking about, you know, I got this really great business, and it's going really well, and none of my kids want it, and they don't want to come into the business, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Business valuation opportunity. Okay? Um, that's, the, that's what I'm referring to. It's the ability to, to listen to somebody talk about their business and to discern an, an opportunity within that. How you, let's see, they've got this kind of problem. I think I can help them with that problem. That's a lot what I would say, soft skills, okay? And, and that's, well, I don't know how you learn that, except just going to a lot of these places and hearing a lot of conversations. Practicing, yeah, just practicing. And again, it's not about, oh, you need an evaluation. Hey, let's do an evaluation. No, no. <clears throat> because you might, have to, you might have to go back to the boss and say, hey, you know, um, I was, last week, I was talking to this guy, and he has this kind of business, and I did a little more research on his business, and here's what I learned, and, da, 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 da. and it sounds like an opportunity here. L let's go talk to him, okay? And I am here to tell you, there are few things that will win you more points with the boss than if you can walk in and say, you know, I was talking to Joe Smith, who owns Smith and Smith kind of thing, and I think there's an opportunity there. Boss loves you for that. They love you for that. They really will. Okay? So soft skills, how do you, how, that's what they are. How do you acquire them? Practice. Um, yeah. Toastmasters. I've heard a lot of people speak well of Toastmasters. If you're not a member, it forces you to think on your feet, to interact with people. Um, probably another place to learn, and it's, this is really just all OJT. You're going to learn it on the job. But another way to do that is to find out what are the professional or trade associations 
that your potential clients belong to? What groups and organizations do they go to? Okay? And at one level, that can be the rotary. All right? Business people. R organizations like Rotary and Lions and all, they're always looking for speakers. They're always looking for presenters. You know, if you've got those kinds of skills and you can make a decent presentation, you'd be surprised at what you can get. Okay? At that's at one level. At another level, it might be um, in a, almost every city of any size, there is an estate, E S T A T E, estate and trust council. Okay? And that's largely attorneys who are in the estate and trust business. And it's their professional association. You go hang out there, you're going to be talking to people who are in a position to give you work. Okay? So it's going to those, and you know, maybe the first half a dozen times you go, you don't even have any expectation of getting any work. You just listen to what they have to say. You listen to what they talk about as, oh, boy, this is a terrible problem. We're having this, you know. And, oh, yeah, I ran into the two. <clears throat> and by the time you've heard the eighth person talk about a certain kind of problem, well, maybe that's something you can do something about. Maybe there's an idea for a service line there. Maybe you can write an article on that. You know? So it's about discerning how to, you know, get in there. Do we have some more? Uh, okay. This is, like, yeah, how much do courses analysts are finance? Boy. Ah, I can't answer that one here. Uh, how will taking business valuation courses help someone who wants to do jobs that are primarily in forensic accounting? Ah. Uh, I don't know a good answer to that, and do you want to, I, I, because I'm, I, the limb I'm going to go out on, it'll saw it off if I, if, if I offer an opinion. So, John, if I may. Please. Uh, there, there certainly is an overlap in the analysis that is done in a business valuation engagement versus a forensic accounting engagement, and oftentimes some business valuation engagements that you get involved in, particularly in a litigation setting, you need forensic accounting skills because whether it be a marital dissolution case where one party may be hiding certain assets or uh, doing some things to the business in order to lower, potentially lower the value of the business that would need to be investigated, uh, or a corporate divorce where one partner might be, uh, again, doing the same type, in that same type of situation. So oftentimes, I, again, I got involved in valuation first, but as I got more and more involved in business valuation, that led to more and more forensic accounting engagements because of the nature of the type of analyses that we do uh, in that specialization. Okay. So just for the, for the, for the audience at home, um, who may not have had, had that. We've been hearing from Rick Gray, and I think the two main points out of his answer are that there is an overlap with regard to the skills that you acquire for analysis and the way that you apply those skills. That's where the overlap is, okay? Um, is an MA in business valuation or France coming good route some bit of career as an auditor? Um, it's okay as an auditor, but um, If, if, if what you want to do is auditing, it may not be the best use of your time and money, let's put it that way, to be in a program of that gets you an MA in business valuation or forensic accounting. It's a very valuable education. It really, really is. Okay? And can you use it in auditing? Well, yeah. All right? There's probably not much you can't use in auditing, given the kind of stuff you're going to run into. But is it, a, is it a smart investment of your time? Probably not, to be honest with you. Okay? Yes? There's one area of auditing that 
is related to valuation, and, uh -huh. it's, and it's just a subset of auditing. Uh, those are the uh, balance sheets that have the kind of assets that need to be valued, what's called mark to market. And there are auditors and people that auditors rely on that need valuation skills in order to do the overall audit on those financial statements. Okay, um, thank you. All right, so I guess the point to be taken out of that is that yes, there is a place where MA in business valuation or forensic accounting can be useful in auditing, okay? It's a very narrow slice of auditing, but it's there, okay? So if that's, if you're interested in that particular slice of auditing, fine, all right? You just, it, but again, it's about knowing ahead of time that how it is that you're going to narrow the universe of opportunity for yourself by the choices that you make now, okay? Uh, how do you sell yourself with only limited accounting, Windows Job Machine, Accounting Degree, or CPA? I don't know. I wish I knew, okay? Fortunately, I've never had to do it. I was lucky to pass Accounting 101. I can balance a checkbook. On, on a good day, I can explain the theory behind double entry bookkeeping, but that's as far as it goes. So I've never had to do that. And Denise is going to give us an answer, yeah, right? Because I've worked with students from every level of experience, whether they're switching careers or coming in um, at, with accounting experience and want the forensic accounting positions after they graduate or during their program. And I want to take your words, uh, your phrase, it depends. It depends on what skill set you're coming in with before uh, and, and how far along you are in the program. If you've got a basic knowledge of accounting, you're at a master's level, employers may be more willing to look at you uh, in terms of some of your past experience and the skill set that transfers into what you could do in an accounting related position. Okay. And also thinking outside of the box for these positions, not necessarily going for the big four or a larger firm, but mm -hmm. looking for a company that's looking for a um, someone starting with the, as a bookkeeper or starting at like a very entry level and they're willing to train you for their specific needs and you're going to get the accounting experience in that position. So I would say think outside of the box and don't just try to, you know, go knocking on the door at Deloitte or EY necessarily, but also <coughs> look um, for uh, ways and, and customize your resume. Look for, you want to you sell yourself. Uh, as much as you can in terms of what skill sets you're, you're bringing to the table that will be useful in an accounting related context. And it's mm -hmm. just, it's like a, it's a translation is what I call it. All right, all right. Um, I think I'm, I'm gonna go over to the whiteboard over here because uh, I'm gonna use something that we were talking about earlier, okay? In valuation, and I don't do valuation, so you gotta take my word, well, you don't have to take my word for it, that there is a very simple and general mathematical equation that they tell me, okay, works in valuation, and I'm going somewhere with this, trust me. Well, let me see if we can get a better one. Oh, here we go. Benefit, no, that's not right. John, you need to learn what you're doing here. Value, okay, here we are. Value equals benefit divided by risk. Okay, very fundamental, but it's a way of looking at the value of anything. All right, now how does that apply in this situation? First of all, Let's assume you're buying a used car, all right? You're the buyer. You're trying to determine what's the value to you of that car. Now, the seller of that car, where is the seller gonna focus? The seller is gonna tell you all the benefit. All the benefit. Oh, well, it's got this, and it's got that, and it's got the navigation, and it's got the Bluetooth, and it's on the, okay? But, as the buyer, where are you focused? Risk. 
risk. Okay? How does that apply in this employment situation? The employer is the buyer. All right? As the seller, your natural inclination is to talk about all of the benefit that you bring. Experience, education, and this and that, and all the benefit that you bring. But where is the employer looking? Risk. That's where the employer is looking. So, relative to this question, how do you sell yourself? Adopt a strategy of explaining how and why you are lower risk. All right? One way to, if you're coming out of a BV class, BV work, for example, one way that you explain why you are lower risk is you're in this for the long haul. All right? One of the biggest complaints, consistent, one of the consistent complaints that I'll hear from employers is that they will hire young people, not young people necessarily, but they'll hire people coming in who are just all Oh, so excited about business valuation. This looks so cool. I really want to do this. Yeah, okay? And they hire the person, and two years later, the person says, Oh, you know, I, I want to go do something else. Maybe I mentioned this earlier. I don't know. But so, so what you talk about in terms of reducing risk is you're in it for the long haul. You wouldn't be in it for, you wouldn't have spent the money, you wouldn't have spent the time in this coursework if you weren't in it for the long haul. So, again, how do you sell yourself? Talk about, find ways to talk about reducing the risk for the employer, all right? And no matter what your situation is, there's a way to do that. It might not be easy to find, it might be challenging to go after, but there's a way to do it, okay? So you talk about reducing risk is how you do that. Uh, how valuable would it be to do a double concentration in forensic? Oh, very valuable. Very valuable. Absolutely. Okay? Very valuable. Leaving aside for a moment the always, always around you issue of breaking in. Okay, because that's just always there, all right? I would say that by having both of those, you've probably increased your universe of opportunity, just relatively speaking, you've increased your universe of opportunity from, let's say, this to this, all right? You really have. Now, I want to relate that concept, universe of opportunities, to um, what was questioned earlier about where are the most jobs, all right? They're, they're all over the place, okay? Now, we are not all fortunate enough to be geographically flexible. I understand that, okay? I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm probably not leaving there for quite a number of years. And there may be those of you who live around here, and you're not leaving here for any number of years, okay? But using this concept of universe of opportunity, I can tell you that you think, think of your choices as binary, all right? Fort Miami, Fort Lauderdale, or not Miami, Fort Lauderdale. So if you are literally open to not Miami, Fort Lauderdale, you've automatically increased the universe of your opportunity from this to this. Okay? And, and sometimes people are quite surprised when I make that point to them. They'll say, you know, I, boy, I really don't want to leave Dallas, Texas. We, you know, that. I said, well, I'll tell you what. You know, you can increase, you, if you, Dallas, fine. There's plenty of opportunities there. Great place. But if you're open to not Dallas, you can increase the size of your universe by a multiple of four or five. Oh. Now, for me, from what I do, though it may sound like it, that's not about arm twisting to me. Because I don't care what decision you make. 
What I care about is that the decision you make is informed. If you know what the results are going to be of the decision you're making, fine. All right? We all make choices like that in our lives. I can point to dozens of them where the choice was something that you, maybe you'd really not, rather not have made that choice, but you did because it was an informed choice. You knew what the ramifications were either way, and you made the choice. Fine. Nobody can argue with that. Nobody can argue with that, and you shouldn't argue with that. Okay? But for me, it's about making informed choices. That's why I try to do this kind of program the way I do. Do we have anything? Double concentration forensic. Okay. Um, I think we're done. Is there any other questions here in the house? Jolice. I just wanted to add, um, for everyone who doesn't know me online, I'm Jolice. I work on the administrative side. Um, we also have a business valuation certificate, so if you're a tax student here or you just want to finish the forensic accounting program first, um, you can contact the administrative office and we can work with you in adding the certificate and hopefully we'll have more presentations on the subject. Thank you very, very much. I always enjoy coming out to meet with people and, and talk about this subject. And um, I'm here for a little bit longer, not in a rush to get out. After we're all done and offline and you want to come up and ask some more questions, glad to talk to you. Thank you very much.